recording in trouble. What? Good job. Good job. I'm going to have to just sign my Matt, would you open us in prayer, please? All right, God, we thank you for this beautiful day that we can join together and uh, just fellowship and, and learn more about you. We ask that you bless this time and be with us as we go into service later this morning. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Zephaniah. What did you do? A lot. Um, what? Yeah. Yeah, what? I'll tell him. What is it, Dad? I have no idea what she was doing, but it's her, so. So, we talked about Zephaniah last time. Um, and the big thing about Zephaniah was the redefinition of the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is an expression uh, indicating a day of victory for the army. But in Zephaniah, the day of the Lord becomes, can I get a clean napkin? Please. Thank you. Uh, it's fine, thank you. Anyway, um, now it's a day of judgment, as we read. Where'd it go? There it is. In 14. You're not even on the list. I, I really? I guess they assume that, that you know, if there's people here that you must be here. Too. <laughs> I, get it. I don't even count. Yeah, you're not even you on don't count. <laughs> I'm sure you count somewhere, <laughs> just not on our list. <laughs> I guess I'll raise you. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. Here, what do you think he's referencing? Given everything I just said. Oh, wait. Can you see that? No, I can't. Well, that's why I asked. Great. I couldn't see it. The great day of the Lord is near. Near and hastening fast. Sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warriors cry loud. It'll be a day of wrath, etc. What do you think he's referring to? Well, I, <laughs> right. So, where does judgment lie in the future for Zephaniah? When is Zephaniah? Last quarter of the 600, 628 or so. Which Josiah has reformed. This is not to be confused with the eighth century prophets who are a century earlier. Okay. Um, Samaria has fallen, 722. It's 100 years later. And things are coming to a head for what entity? Yes. Judah. Judah's about to fall. 
the Southern Kingdom? The destruction of Jerusalem? Well, it starts in 605, uh, but the 586 is the destruction of Jerusalem. So that's still 15, 30, 45 years down the road. Um, this day is coming. It's coming fast. Well, it's coming. I don't know about fast. But that brings us to Habakkuk. Now, can I ask a question before you start that? You may. What is it? Like, is this just present for Zephaniah and like his few friends, or is the whole culture and society feeling this? Figure? They're denying it. There, there's no way God's going to allow His temple. To be harmed. So they think Zephaniah is off his rocker. And uh, they do not anticipate it coming. The major power at this time is still Assyria. But now when we turn to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, which sounds like a Japanese mower company to me. Mower? Lawnmower. I have a back on the back of zero turn mower. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> That's to me. A back of the name means one who hugs. A hugger. Mom gave him the name, who knows? Okay. Or his dad. He wasn't. He had the name but wasn't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, if he was ironic or like a a wicked person named Grace. Yeah, exactly. So the Assyrians are the major power in the world until 612. Remember, we're, this is a time period of intense, cosmo, not cosmological, um, geopolitical change. There's Nineveh. There's the capital of this area. They're the head dogs. Babylon should say province of Babylon. The Assyrians captured Egypt in the 680s. And in 612, Babylon's going to rebel and attack Nineveh and take it. It's St. It's Petersburg attacking Berlin and winning and throwing them off. The Nazis, 612, 605, they ceased to exist. So in seven years, they completely wiped out the, the Assyrians. And then the Babylonians are in charge. And this is, this is the background to Habakkuk's uh, work. So you see the city Iran that I just searched for? So what happened in 612? They're going to get attacked. Syrians are going to retreat to here. And then they're going to, here they're going to be finally destroyed. It's a battle that takes several years, but they will be wiped out. And in 605, they'll be eliminated. So um, that's when Babylon attacks Judah. So we we're in a tumultuous time now, but not as tumultuous as it was in 1935. That would have been a lot more jolting. 
Now it's Ukraine spiting Russia, big whoop. Now they can do what they want. Uh, but this unsettledness. Uh, so back up. Let's, he has Zephaniah's vision from 25 years earlier. He knows that it's been given to Judah somehow. Remember, we talked about this because, as we said, nobody, you know, I did all that and you guys couldn't see it. I was <laughs> sorry about that. I was looking at my map this whole time and you guys were just. Sitting there. So here's Haran. Here's Nineveh. Babylonians can attack it, they'll retreat to here. And then from uh, by 605, the Assyrians will be eliminated and the Babylonians will be in charge. Trying to get Babylon there, it is down here. So Geopolitical turmoil, the major powers. I mean, to have the Soviet Union fell. Do you have any memory of 1989? I don't know how old you are. Because you all stare at me like. I was in kindergarten. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> she wasn't born. She wasn't born. Yes. The fall of the Soviet Union. A, a, a famous scholar wrote a book called The End. What was it? Not the end of war. But. Or the triumph of Western civilization. Something to the effect that the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War meant everything that we won. Except it didn't work out that way. You know, because we forgot about Islam. And we forgot that the Soviet Union was keeping Islam at bay. And now all of a sudden, ooh. so, um, and now we have the, what we have today. And just to give you a heads up, China's in turmoil. You don't know how long they're going to survive in this current format. Because the Christian church there is strong. It's subtle, but it's strong. And there's only so far they can push it. And the ruling powers have proven corrupt and people are not tolerating it as much. And you'll start seeing, I mean, she could tell us more, but she could, I would not be surprised if we saw an upheaval of some sort. Uh, you remember Tiananmen Square, right? Do you remember that incident? I had a big poster in my office. What? 89. What? Yeah. You remember the guy standing in front of the tanks? They hunted him down and killed him later. At least that's what I've read. So, uh, no. He stopped him and they, they stopped. It was that's why it was so remarkable. Just a guy with shopping bags coming home. They didn't do the killing in public view. No, they didn't. They they got him later. They machine gunned a bunch of them in an underground tunnel right off of the Tiananmen Square. Mm. The uh and they had their own little Statue of Liberty. Do you remember any of this? Well, how old were you in 89? I never heard about it until high school. There was a teacher. She was pretty young. She just mentioned she was like, she, she said something about 89 that nobody knew. We were at Oregon High School. We don't know what she was talking about. She was never mind that she moved on to another Wow. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we, we live in interesting times. So Habakkuk, let's look at this. I could 
There we go. Who volunteers to read? Are you kidding? Then read, please. The oracle of the prophet Habakkuk saw. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for your help? And you will not listen. Or cry to you, violence, and you will not say. <clears throat> Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. Okay, he's actually not talking about Judah being assaulted. He's talking about the wicked within Judah. The uh, and How long are you going to tolerate this? He's going to get an answer. He's not going to like it. Look at the nations and see. Be astonished. Be astounded. For a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. Now, this is God replying to Habakkuk. Well, it's the context now. Continue. For I am rousing the Chaldeans. Uh, it's like CH in chemistry. Called Chaldeans. And this is the Babylonians. Okay. Remember our Chaldeans are down here. I'm rousing them. It's like you can say like the U.S. or you can say like people from Oklahoma or so some of them, some of this regional, some of this based on. Yeah. yeah. You're right. No. Okay. Verse six. For I'm rousing the Cald Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they, their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. <clears throat> their horses are swifter than leopards, more menacing than wolves at dusk. Their horses charge, their horsemen come from far away, and they fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence with faces pressing forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and of rulers they make spoil. They laugh at every fortress and heap up earth to take it. Then they sweep by like the wind. They transgress and become guilty. Their own might is their God. All right. I got to run to the restaurant right quick. But I want you to hear. How long are you going to let these perverts, that's not the word, these oppressors get away with their oppression in Judah? How long are you going to let them, the wicked do this? One well, Sunday, who called in? Oops. You can anticipate what he's going to say. I'll be right back. Oh, 
Are you not from of old, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? You shall not die. O Lord, you have marked them for judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for punishment. Okay. I want you to get kind of the tone. Are you not from old? You won't die. These guys will. This is the, uh, Habakkuk talking, and he's not happy. Really? You're going to use the Babylonians. Verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to behold evil, and you cannot look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous and are silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they? You have made people like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. The enemy brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out of out with his net. He, he gathers them in his same. So he rejoices and exults. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his same. For by then his portion is lavish and his food is rich. <clears throat> is he then to keep on emptying his net and destroying nations without mercy? So... <laughs> Habakkuk, God, how long are you going to let the wicked get away with this in Judah? Well, I'm not. I'm sending Babylon. What? How can you send the Babylonians? How can you use, how can you use Satanists to judge your church? That's kind of essentially what he's saying. That makes no sense. Nah, no. And so he says, 2-1, um, Daniel, I read for me. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Oh, yeah. I'm going to stand right here, stomping his foot, until you answer me. <laughs> then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Oh, well, this is the famous verse in Habakkuk. Write the vision. Make it plain. The idea is make it big enough and plain enough that if guy's running by, he can still read the billboard. Okay? For there is a vision. This is God talking to Habakkuk. If it doesn't seem to happen, just wait. It will come. Verse 4. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. And this is our most famous verse. The righteous shall live by faith. And we can look at various translations. Okay, the uh, 
Your faith in me is how you'll survive. Not in the sense that's going to keep you alive, but this is how you will make sense of what's happening. How I can use the Babylonians to do my work. Oh, and by the way, the Babylonians aren't going to live forever either. So, huh. Verse 5. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His reed is as wide as shale. Like death, he is never at ending. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. So, oh. okay. How can you use the Babylonians? Trust me, it's essentially his answer. That's the essence of the righteous shall live by faith. It's, trust me, I know what I'm doing. If you knew what I knew, this would make sense. You don't. Oh, and by the way, the Babylonians are going to get theirs. Josh, why don't you read for us? I have it up here in case you. Nope. Shall not all these things take up their taunt against him, the scoffing and riddles for him, and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled with them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to the cities and all who dwell in them. All right. So Babylon is it well? Syrian Empire extends past my map. Babylonian Empire, including, you'll notice, Judah, which on the Syrian Empire did not. Babylon's, and it's, who's worse, the Nazis or the communists? Neither one of them are something you want to live in. And this is Babylon, but they're going to be gone like that. 536, they're out of here. The Persians will take them out. And the Persians are a different animal, as you've heard me explain before. They, uh, they're actually fairly enlightened. Romans don't agree. And since we're of the West, we tend to look at things the way Rome does. Persia was actually, remember Darius and what he does. That's just remarkable. So, Babylon, I will use them, but I will judge them as well. That's what he's saying. Continue, please. Yes. Who's talking? Oh. Um, so, as we're reading through the, the, the prophets, like that scripture that you say, you know, the, the famous one about two kings, in Bible studies that I've been in before, it's like, oh, this is what God has for us, for our, for our future. But the way it's written, the way we're discussing it, is that it was not for our future, it was for the future of the people at that time. And so, mm -hmm. is it misconstrued then to call it our future as well? Because that's confusing me. What do you think? I don't know. That's why. <laughs> I mean, I think that the Bible repeats themes and repeats stories, and that's made clear, but. I would see that 
often scriptures are misappropriated and claimed when they have nothing to do with us. Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, good and perfect and a future and a hope. Everybody loves to quote that, but nobody likes to quote the preceding verse. Oh, you're going into exile for 70 years. But the plans I have for you are for a future and a hope. They'll claim 11, not 10, when it clearly the whole passage is talking about Judah. And we'll get to it when we read Jeremiah. But yes, the problem is scriptures are multi-applicable. And you, you, they do do that. And you go, huh. And when you read Paul, the righteous shall live by faith, he uses that in a context that is utterly unrelated to this. He is not talking about Israel survive or Judah surviving judgment or us being able to understand what God's actions are, which is what this is. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Paul says, no, you live by faith, not by works. This isn't talking about that. Paul is. And you go, okay, what do I do with that? Part of my answer is, well, I'm not Paul, so I don't get to play like that. But God speaks how God speaks. And what he speaks to you and what he speaks to others may be different. I mean, it's going to be within his personality, don't get me wrong. But if you make something stand out to you, that doesn't make it illegitimate. As long as you realize you're not giving the interpretation of that passage. It's just God speaking to you through that passage. Does that make sense? That's what that thing can be. Well, it can be. But that's why you have neighbors. That's why you share it with your sisters and your brothers. And we go, Nick, I think you may be missing this. Does that make sense, too? So... Well, then, if none of this spoke true to my future, then why do I care about the Old Testament? And my response is always so that I can understand the character. Well, yeah. It's, so, so you see how God works. Well, he spoke to this guy about that. And that's how specific he got. So don't be surprised if he gets specific with you. And that's... I'm not going to lie. Like, I already explained this. I want to finish up Habakkuk. He ends with a poem. Call it a prayer, but he gets his poem. And it's again a famous passage. Um, Daniel, have you read today? Nikki, read for me, please. Uh, starting at 3 2. Three, 1. Uh, prayer of Habakkuk. And the prophet, according to someone. Uh, who cares? Yeah. Shiggy on notes, whatever that is. Oh, Lord, I have heard the report. It's a tune. It's exactly what it is. Play it to this. According to, you know, old Lane Zine. All right. Um, oh, Lord, I have heard the report of you. In your work, oh, Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman. Hey, Mom, that's Yemen. Yemen. Modern and Yemen. And the Holy One from the Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. 
Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the inter eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? By the way, those are motifs from ancient conquest hymns of various cultures where the gods fight the, the waters. The waters are seen as a power of chaos, like the flood. You strip the sheep from your bow. 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 Calling for many arrows. Selah. There's, you split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. God is a war god. Is what's being celebrated here. Keep going. Cool. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from the thick of Thick thigh to neck, gross, Selah. He pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like the whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your forces, the surging of the mighty waters. I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. But the fig tree. This is another famous verse out of this book. Is this verse right here? Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. That's it. So, though the economy utter collapse, utterly collapse, Nothing's working. No flocks, no crops. Yet I will trust in the Lord. That's what he says. That's how Habakkuk ends. And that's why it's a famous verse. Because people celebrate this. Babylon hasn't fallen yet. That's going to be another tumultuous time. Jerusalem hasn't fallen yet. That's still coming. That's what Habakkuk is sensing. You're going to use Babylon, to judge Judah. So even though all hell breaks loose, I will live by faith. I will trust in the Lord. That's what he's saying. A lesson we can all learn from. All right. Would you close us in prayer, please? What? Uh, sure. I was, I was pointing at you. Lord, thank you for our day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can trust in you and help us to do that. And, and, and bless us today. Help us love each other the way you want us to. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay.